Hi all! In this section, we're going to review some of the basics of skeletal muscle gross anatomy. Following this section, I'd like you to be able to describe the location and the main characteristics of tendons, define an aponeurosis, apply basics of muscle terminology, describe the layers of connective tissue associated with muscle and the relationship with tendons, describe fascia and its location, describe a motor unit, describe the location of a neurovascular bundle in relation to the muscle it supplies, and distinguish muscle attachment sites. Now when you see a muscle in the lab or on images, you'll be looking at this muscle belly here. And this is a well-vascularized area containing fascicles of muscle fibers. Now extending on either side, away from that muscle belly, is the tendon, and this attaches the muscle to bone. And the parallel collagen here makes it a shiny white appearance. However, this is not a well vascularized area, so this can be slow to heal when there's an injury with a tendon. Now many of the muscles are attached to bone through rope-like tendons, However, a tendon can also be sheet-like, like we see here on the abdominal wall, and we call that an aponeurosis. In the abdomen, the rectus sheath is an aponeurosis made up of the tendons of three different muscles, and this provides strength to the muscular abdominal wall. While the typical definition will have muscle attaching to bone, muscle can also attach to skin to lead to movements of it or to another muscle. As we discussed with the terminology related to bones, anatomy is a new language. When learning muscles, I will point out word meanings along the way. We can see from the image that muscles come in many different shapes, and frequently that shape gives it its name. So we can see here on the cap of our shoulder, this triangular shaped muscle is the deltoid. Another word root that you'll see within muscle names is seps. This refers to the number of heads or the different attachment points to bones. So the biceps in the arm has two heads. The triceps, posterior here, has three. And in the thigh, we find the quadriceps, which has four. Now the length or the size of the tendon or the muscle can also be noted in the name. Often there are two muscles that are close to one another, one with a longer tendon and one with a shorter tendon. An example of this is going to be the fibularis longus and brevis. So you can think of the longus being the longer tendon and brevis being shorter. The muscle name may also tell you something about its location. For instance, the biceps brachii. Brachii refers here to arm. And then we have quadriceps femoris. And femoris refers to the thigh. Now finally, the action of a muscle may be directly in the name. These include muscles like the adductors of the thigh or the flexors of the forearm. So let's do a quick ex experiment. I'll give you a name of a muscle and I want you to try to make sense of what you see in the name. So we'll go with extensor, carpi, radialis, longus. Now from this name, we know one of its actions here. Based on the fact that it's an extensor, we know it extends. Now it extends at what area? Here we see carpi. Now carpi refers to the wrist, as I have noted up above here. Um, so this muscle extends at the wrist. And carpi, another word you'll hear is carpal bones, and those are the bones, the small bones within your wrist. 
radialis is on the side of the forearm with the radius bone. So in the forearm, we have the radius and the ulna, and the radius is found on the lateral side or the thumb side. Then longus means there's likely an extensor carpi radialis brevis running with it, and this longus has a longer tendon in comparison. So now we know that this muscle is in the forearm, it extends the wrist, and it's on the lateral or the radial side next to the extensor carpi radialis brevis. So as you're learning different muscles, think about the names and how you can apply these types of terminologies to it to learn a little bit more about the muscle. So connective tissues play a huge role in muscle organization and function to help protect against wear and tear. So let's revisit the image from an earlier video. So the muscle fiber, that muscle cell, has a layer of connective tissue around it, which is called the endomesium. So the innermost part, right around the cell, outside of the sarcolemma, is the endomesium. Now a bundle of fibers in a fascicle are then contained within the next layer, which is the perimesium, found just outside of the endomesium. Now the shiny layer we see grossly wrapping around a muscle belly is called the epimesium. So the epimesium is also called muscular or deep fascia. Now all of this is continuous with the tendon that blends with the periosteum on the bone. So the connective tissue surrounds the muscle and also provides a channel for the neurovasculature to reach each fiber. Now fascia will be your favorite if you do anatomical dissection as a part of your educational journey. In part, I am joking as removing fascia will feel extremely tedious, but fascial planes create important spaces to help us know the layers of the body. So within the limbs, we find these thick layer of fascia outside of that last layer we saw that went around the muscle belly. So here in this image, we see a cross section and around each muscle, you see it's epimesium or it's deep fascia. Now another type of fascia, we can call this one compartment fascia, but is often just referred to as fascia, will wrap around multiple muscles and their epimesium. So often these muscles share an action or an innervation, or both, and this is especially true of the lower limb. So these are like little file folders organizing muscles by action and innervation. Now fascia as a word is used to describe many different things from the subcutaneous tissue to this thick compartment fascia to the fascia surrounding all of the layers of the type of the parts of the muscle. So it is quite a broad umbrella term. Movement is not produced by the contraction of one fiber alone. Instead, motor units are recruited to produce specific types of movements. So motor units are all of the muscle fibers associated with one motor neuron. So we can see in this image here that this one fiber has its branch from the motor neuron. And we can imagine that motor neuron as it courses through the muscle will give branches off to other muscle fibers as well as the one we're seeing here. So all of those muscle fibers together, innervated by that one motor neuron, are a motor unit. So motor units vary greatly in their size, allowing for extremely precise movements from small units or very forceful movements from larger units. Now as we approach our regional anatomy, we'll talk about the nerves that are innervating each muscle. They typically run deep to the muscle in a bundle with vasculature. We call that a neurovascular bundle. We can see that muscles here in this image have been reflected so that you can see the neurovascular bundles running through the forearm. 
Now, one striking exception to this is the serratus anterior muscle. We'll find that on the lateral wall of the body, the nerve running on the serratus anterior is superficial to that muscle. So it's in a vulnerable space comparative to the others. Now, limb muscles will receive their innervation from one named nerve, and it's derived from a plexus. Remember the brachial plexus, the lumbar plexus, the sacral plexus? So these are a coming together of spinal nerves to form named nerves that we find in the extremities. Now, trunk muscles, on the other hand, will receive their innervation from multiple levels as well, but from individual spinal nerves. These we can see are spread out and distribute throughout the body evenly. When we learn about muscles, we talk about their attachment sites. Typically, one attachment point is more stable and the other is more movable. So the more stable point is usually closer to the axial skeleton, like we see here with the latissimus dorsi, where it's attached to these vertebrae and the pelvic girdle. The more movable attachment site is usually more distal, like we see here on the humerus. So as you're learning new muscles, pay attention to how the attachments are oriented compared to the joints. For instance, the quadriceps femoris muscle has four heads. One attaches superior to the hip. The other three heads attach to the femur, which is inferior to the hip. This one head over here is going to act at the hip and the rest of them, along with this one over here, will all act on one joint at the knee. Now let's take a question. With which connective tissue structure does the branch of a motor nerve that supplies a muscle fiber course? The endomesium, epimesium, fascia, perimesium, periosteum, or tendon? So pause so you can pick an answer and write out what you remember about the other terms. So here, the question is asking which connective tissue structure is associated with a muscle fiber? Where the nerve branch to that muscle fiber would course. So the most internal layer surrounding a muscle fiber is that endomesium. So that's the correct answer here. We can see then this layer would be the perimesium, and that final is the epi, or above, mesium. Now fascia is a pretty broad term, and in this case, we're talking about it in terms of the compartment fascia. So that's around a whole group of muscles instead of just one fiber. The periosteum is that layer on the bone itself, and then the tendon attaches to that periosteum. Great, thank you so much for your attention and I will see you in the next video.